Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children of all ages, this time on The Artist Heart, we have a stellar pack show for you. Join Katie and I as we continue our journey in the north of Scotland. Our good friend Carol McDougall will be sharing the story of four of Scotland's most well-known clans. And in our feature, I'll be showing you how I created the bright and vibrant painting, The Autumn Forest. That and so much more on today's show. Let's begin today's show with our good friend Carl McDougall, who's going to tell you about Scottish Scotland. clans. There can be few countries where so much history is packed into such a gloriously dramatic landscape. From the rolling hills of the border marches, where roving bands of armed horsemen fought their bitter feuds, to the highlands and islands, where Gaelic-speaking clans etched the names of their ancestors in blood. Those desperate, ruthless, yet noble people used to dominate this landscape. Theirs is a story of conflict and feud, of loyalty and betrayal, of love and death, and is, in effect, the story of Scotland. This is an ancient country whose roots are 3,000 generations deep. It's a land with a clearly defined history and a distinct cultural identity, enshrined by traditions and customs that are instantly recognisable across the world, helping make this a country where the past is always present. Ancient hatreds are written into these hills and glens. For centuries, this was a war-torn country where murderous rivalries reigned supreme. Family fought family, clan against clan. In this series, I'm going to experience life as the clans folk lived it, getting under the skin of history to reveal the stories of the men and women who gave us the extraordinary, unique legacy of Scotland's clans. More than 120 million people across the world are descended from the clans of Scotland. If you or your family are amongst them, then why not join me in an unforgettable journey into our shared heritage? Thank you, Carl, and we'll join you again later on in the show. But before we do that, let me show you the first stages of the Autumn Forest. Over the sea, so far from me, friends that I knew suddenly flew. 
spreading their wings Years gone by In the albatross sky Poverty days so far away Saying goodbye And it all comes round Okay, now let's return to Carl, who's going to tell us about two very famous Scottish clans. And this was the story of how the Macdonalds became the biggest and most powerful clan of all. For centuries they ruled the western seaboard and controlled an empire big and powerful enough to challenge the kings of Scotland. And the story starts with an extraordinary man, Somerled, the greatest of all Celtic warrior kings. This half-Norse fighter beat the Vikings at their own game and rose to such power that his descendants were known as the Lords of the Isles. With a fleet of smaller craft that could outmanoeuvre the Viking longboats, Somerland drove them from the positions of power and established an island empire that stretched the length of the west coast. In Gaelic, he was known as Rena Nielen, the King of the Isles. This is the story of Somerled's rise and his eventual defeat at the Battle of Renfrew, but it's also the story of a clash of cultures between the Highland and the Lowland worlds. But the name MacDonald isn't simply renowned because they were lords of the Isles. Part of their fame seems to rest on an entirely different series of events that came to a bloody climax in the Valley of Glencoe. This is the story of how a clan who were so powerful they could establish and maintain their own Celtic parliament were eventually diminished by powerful enemies and internal struggles. And in the end, the only victor was the ruling Stuart monarchy. But the MacDonald story didn't end there, for they appear to be flourishing, numbering more than half a million members worldwide. And a recent survey suggests that one in four MacDonalds can trace their origins back to Somerled. Elendonan Castle on the shores of Loch Duig is one of Scotland's most immediately recognisable landmarks. And it's here that the Mackenzie clan settled at the end of the 13th century. By the 17th century, the Mackenzies were one of the most powerful clans in the Highlands, and their power came from successive royal patrons. The remoteness of the Highlands meant they were effectively beyond the law. They were far removed from the centre of government in Edinburgh, and it took days for Highland news to reach the capital. The king was forced to use clans with local knowledge and manpower to assert their authority, and the Mackenzies effectively became royal agents in the north. The Highlanders and their behaviour embarrassed James VI. He hated Gaelic culture, found the language barbaric and their behaviour worse. And the more distant they were, the more trouble they caused, which meant the Macleods on the island of Lewis were almost ungovernable. James had tried to colonise Lewis with Lowlanders, who were allowed to use whatever means were necessary to bring the Macleods to heel, including slaughter, mutilation and fire-raising. 
And when that failed, he brought in the Mackenzies. Centuries of royal patronage delivered an empire that stretched from the east coast of Scotland to the Hebrides, but loyalty to the Stuarts cost the Mackenzies their lands and titles after the first Jacobite rebellion in 1715. In April 1719, an advance party of 300 Spaniards occupied Elendonan in an abortive attempt at rebellion. The Highlanders did not join them, and the main Spanish force never arrived. But three Royal Navy frigates arrived, and when their frag of truce was fired on, they pounded Elendonan for two days and finished the job with some leftover gunpowder. The castle was ruined, and that was how it stayed for 200 years. It took 13 years to rebuild Elendonan, and today it's one of Scotland's most popular tourist attractions. It has appeared in films and joins Edinburgh Castle and Balmoral on the list of Scottish icon buildings.
The Frasers are a clan with more than one chief. Firstly, the Frasers of Palorth, the Lord Sol Toon, are chief of the Fraser name. The Highland Fraser chief is Lord Lovett, and the lands of Inverness share around Black Isle and the Firth of Bewley are traditional Fraser of Lovett territory. Warrior skills lay at the heart of Highland society, and no family was more aware of this than the Stuarts. During what became known as the Jacobite Rebellion, they took Highland loyalty for granted. Not all clans rushed to help. Many joined the cause, but others were a wee bit cautious. The Frasers of Palorth, for example, took no part in the Jacobite Rebellion. And the chief of the warrior Frasers of Lovett tried to prevent his men from fighting with the Jacobites at the Battle of Killicranky in 1689. But when they marched without him, Thomas Fraser gave in and joined them. His successor, Simon Fraser, was known as the Fox. He was 78 years old at the outbreak of the 1745 rebellion and, following the Jacobite victory at Preston Pans, sent his son to fight for their cause. After the Jacobite defeat at Culloden, he took to the hills and was captured near Loch Morar. On the 9th of April 1747, Simon Fraser became the last man to be executed at the Tower of London. His death was a public spectacle. A spectator's gallery collapsed and it said that Simon spent his last moments in hysterical laughter, which literally gave rise to the expression, to laugh one's head off. And when another Simon Fraser, the 17th Lord Lovett, captain of the Lovett Scouts his father had founded, landed on Sword Beach on the 6th of June 1944 during the invasion of Normandy, the Fraser's extraordinary military history came full circle. He was back where the Fraser started. The man at the head of his commando brigade was a descendant of a Norman knight who had fought with Scotland's kings and Simon the Fox who had been executed for treason and was now helping to liberate Normandy. Against specific orders, Lord Lovett instructed his personal piper, 21-year-old Bill Millen, to play the commanders ashore. Millen played Highland Laddie and Road to the Isles, which you would have thought would have made him an obvious target. German soldiers later said they didn't shoot him because they thought he was mad. Moy, south of Inverness, has been the home of the Macintosh chiefs since the 14th century. The first seat was on an island in the middle of the loch. This castle is now completely ruined. In later years, the chiefs took up residence at Moy Hall, which was demolished in the 20th century and replaced by a smaller, modern house of the same name. The Macintosh clan was part of a confederation of smaller clans that came together in the Middle Ages for mutual protection. Together they formed a sort of super clan called Clan Chatham. The Macintosh clan chief was usually the leader of Clan Chatham, though there was a long rivalry with the Macpherson chiefs for the position. And as the senior partners of the Clan Chatham Confederation, the Macintosh clan took part in a feud with Clan Cameron that lasted for 350 years. When the 22nd clan chief Angus Macintosh was offered the captaincy of one of the companies that later became the Black Watch, his wife Lady Anne rode through the glens dressed as a man and enlisted 97 of the 100 men required for the captaincy. The following year, Angus's company fought with the government forces during the Jacobite Rebellion. The chief's wife, Anne Farquharson Macintosh, known as Colonel Anne, disapproved, and so did his mother. 
In 1745, age 22, she raised between 200 and 400 men, this time for Prince Charles Edward Stuart's Jacobite forces. And following the last successful Jacobite battle at Falkirk Muir, Bonnie Prince Charlie was staying at Moy Hall when Colonel Anne was warned that 1,500 men, including her husband's company, were stationed at Inverness and they planned to snatch the prince and claim the £30,000 bounty the government had placed on his head. Anne sent five retainers out to watch the road and when several hundred government troops came marching towards them in the dark, they fired pistols and shouted war cries which convinced the Hanoverian forces that they were being ambushed by the entire Jacobite army. Two months later the Macintoshes suffered heavy losses at Culloden where they are buried in a mass grave. Well, folks, I want to thank you for joining us on this extended Artist Heart special, Clans, Kilts and Forests, and we really hope you've enjoyed and found all the information today insightful. Join us next time for another exciting episode of The Artist Heart, and until next time, I have been your host, John Morris. What perfect view to leave you with today of this beautiful waterfall here in Loch Tay. Take care. God bless.